Airbnb was the go-to spot to book a place when you're going on vacation. It's meant to be a great alternative to pricey hotel stays with spotty internet connections, and it shook the industry and changed the game for travelers everywhere. But because the space wasn't well regulated, some guests were renting homes for one night and throwing these massive parties. It made neighbors wary of living next to an Airbnb. And soon after, cities started creating rental ordinances that banned short-term rentals in most major metros like San Francisco and even here in Dallas. Right, the party's over for Airbnb renters. The company said yesterday that its temporary ban on parties and other large noisy events is now permanent. If hosts are not playing by the rules, this legislation will require platforms to take down those listings. So being a host hasn't been easy lately. And as a real estate investor with several short and midterm rentals, I've even started seeing a decline in bookings. So that leads us to a big question. How did short-term rentals get so big and fail so quickly? So today I'm gonna to be reacting to How Money Works' video about it and share my thoughts. Short-term rentals are a $100 billion market that have reshaped global tourism, accelerated a nationwide housing crisis and created fortunes for early adopters. But now, customers, the government, the public, and the hosts themselves are turning their back on a concept that started out as a fun alternative to stuffy hotel chains, but became everything wrong with modern real estate. One of the major benefits of renting a property out as a short-term rental is that you can get a massive increase in your rents every single month. For example, in the Bay Area, if you've rented out a normal home, you probably get $3,000 to $3,500. But if you rented out that same home as a fully furnished rental, you can get upwards of $5,000 to $6,000 for that same property. All right, the party's over for Airbnb renters. The company said yesterday that its temporary ban on parties and other large noisy events is now permanent. I've put all my savings into, into my unit. I'm following all the rules, paying all the taxes, buying the business license. Ultimately, our goal is to get more housing back into the housing market for people to be able to rent. Parties are a big issue with Airbnbs, and I'm not gonna lie, I was part of that problem in the past. Many groups of friends in their early 20s need a big place to stay and host their social gatherings, and it won't work in their small apartments. You can book a place for one night, host a great party, and then deal with the consequences later on. Massive amount of debt that Airbnb hasn't paid on the books that they're hiding. Tens of millions, hundreds of millions, possibly even a billion dollars plus of debt that they have not paid. So we are looking around and are saying, what can we do right away that makes more homes available? One of the biggest issues with a short-term rental is that it takes away the housing supply for regular renters in a market. As a host, why would I rent my property for 3,000 when I can get $6,000 a month? But that being said, as a regular renter who lives in this area, they probably can't even afford that $6,000 a month. So it makes it very hard for people who live in the area and they want more housing units. The short-term rental market took off when Brian Chesky and Joe Joe Gebbia tried to rent out a spare room with an air mattress to attendees of a conference because they realized all of the hotel rooms had been booked out. They called their service Air Bed and Breakfast, which was later shortened to the short stay app that you know and love or hate today. Airbnb is now worth more than hotel chains like Hilton and Wyndham combined. I think a big factor to the valuation is that they're not a real estate company, they're a technology company. It was a good idea. Customers loved it for giving them a cheaper alternative to outdated hotels, and hosts liked the opportunity to earn extra income on a spare bedroom or even an entire separate property. So initially, the plan was to rent out just a spare bedroom or maybe a sofa that you have in your room, but nowadays, people are using it to rent out entire properties or entire units. The first problem lies with the people who it's hardest to feel sorry for, the hosts. Airbnb and other short-term rental platforms provided a unique opportunity for people to profit off real estate in a totally new way. Having a roommate existed long before Airbnb, but the platform let homeowners offer their spare rooms to travelers who could pay up to triple what a long-term roommate would pay since budget was the reason that they were looking for a roommate instead of a place of their own. When I rented out my rooms in the Bay Area, I was only charging my friends $650 a month. Eventually, it increased to $800 a month, but even then, that's far lower than what most people were renting a room for in the Bay Area. If I rented that room out on Airbnb, I could probably get $1,500 a month. If you had an extra bedroom to rent out in your apartment, you could find a long long-term roommate. But then you run the risk that they are the type of person who is messy, loud, doesn't pay the rent on time, or is just a clash with your own personality. That's why I only rented to friends that I already knew beforehand. With a short-term tenant, any problems are only going to last as long as they're short stay. That's not always true. I mean, sometimes guests last longer than they were supposed to, or while they're there, they're really, really bad because like you can't really vet these people, right? They're people who book on the platform so you don't get to talk to them beforehand, and then they're in your personal living space. So I don't know if I'd be really comfortable renting on a room like this. Other advantages are that payments are 
are handled through the Airbnb platform. There was a rating system that controlled bad behavior. And if you ever wanted the house to yourself because family was coming over or just wanted a quiet week to yourself, it was as easy as blocking out those dates on the app. I absolutely love the fact that payments are handled on the platform and same thing with all the contracts and stuff. Because as a landlord, it is very annoying to have to get a security deposit, deal with payments, and just making sure that they are responsible for paying me on time. But on the platform, I just get paid. I don't have to worry about it. But sharing a spare room and staying with a random person while on vacation only appealed to a certain type of alternative alternative traveler. Most people who Airbnb are putting up entire properties for guests to use as exclusive accommodations. And honestly, our strategy is marketing to professionals who need to be in an area for an extended period of time, but not long enough to have their own place. For example, if an employee is being flown into an area to work on a contract project for three months, they only really want to get a 12 month lease, have to get all new furniture, hook up all the utilities, and then be gone in three months. So they can just book our place where it already has all the utilities, it already has all the furnishings, and yeah, they pay a little bit more, but honestly, when they get moved out like that, the company usually pays on their behalf. Property owners could make as much as double the rent from short-term stays after paying Airbnb fees than they could from long-term rent rentals, even if their property was only rented out for half the year. I've even heard of some extreme cases where this one guy packed 20 interns into one room and charged them each $1,500. So he made a lot of money that summer. The downside was that short-term rentals required more effort because the property needed constant cleaning between stays and there was less guarantee of consistent income. Thing is, with most Airbnbs, you charge the cleaning fee back to the guest. So it really doesn't matter that much. And because being cleaned so much, it's actually in pretty good condition relative to someone who lives in a house for, you know, more than five years. Large scale Airbnb landlords, the Airbnb barons if you will, design properties with the express intention of cutting down on the effort required from them. They fitted doors with keypad locks that could be changed remotely between guests easily cleanable surfaces, inexpensive but fashionable fittings, and preferred properties with minimal landscaping. All of this cut down on the additional efforts hosts needed to put into managing a property. But like all good things, it didn't last forever. Airbnb advertised its platform just as hard to new hosts as it did to guests, and investors started buying multiple homes to turn them into Airbnbs. Some hosts turned managing their Airbnb properties into a full-time job, effectively purchasing a job as a hotel general manager. One thing about having an Airbnb is you're not really in the real estate game anymore. You're in like the services game now. It's like running a hotel. You need to make sure they have a pleasant stay and you're gonna do anything for that sweet five-star review. Realtors in high tourist areas started offering short-term property management services where just like they would manage traditional long-term tenants, the realtors would instead manage the short-term rentals with some services even handling the listing on Airbnb. B. Their fee was higher, but the higher short-term rental price meant owners still came out ahead. Short-term rental managers on these platforms charge 20% of the gross income, whereas a long-term property manager will only charge 10%. So if you think about it, it's a very lucrative industry. As a long-term property manager, I can get a property leased up for $3,000 a month and get $300 a month for being a property manager. But as a short-term manager, I get 20% of $6,000, so I'm getting $1,200 a month. So you're actually making four times for doing this type of work. The additional cash flows from higher yielding short-term rentals also made it easier to qualify for more home loans because the additional income could be used to pay for the loan on the next property and the next property. So what he's saying here is that you can use the higher incomes you make from Airbnb to qualify for more loans to buy more properties in an Airbnb and continue like this. Now, I'm not 100% that this is entirely true because when I was a loan officer, we all understood that the money you make from short-term rentals is very spotty. It's not as consistent as long-term rentals. So typically what we would do is we would take 75% of the gross rents that they would make from the property and then apply it towards our income to qualify for a higher debt-to-income ratio. The inevitable result was clear. For little additional effort, hosts could make more money from their property so the market became oversaturated and hosts started to struggle to rent out their properties enough to make it worthwhile. Short-term rentals also made long-term rentals more expensive. So the gap between what someone can make from a short-term rental versus what they can make from a long-term rental is narrowing. For many hosts, it's no longer worth the additional risk and effort to rent out property short-term. And for the others that could only afford their loans because of the higher rent they got from the short-term rental yields, they might be forced to sell. Again, I don't know too many people who are in this exact scenario where they over leveraged based on the income that they got from Airbnb. It's more so because of the city ordinances, bans, and general lack of occupancy in their properties that they just want to sell and get out of the business. Hotels had become overpriced and didn't cater to what a lot of people really wanted when they went away on vacation. 
Hotels provide a lot of amenities like housekeeping, room service, restaurants, concierge desks, meeting rooms, gyms, spas, pools, valet parking, and 24-hour security. To be honest, when I go to a hotel, I don't care about any of those things. What I like the most about it is the consistency. Like, I know that there's a good bed there, I know that there's good towels there, the showers are usually pretty good, and they have small things like soaps and shampoos. Whereas with an Airbnb, you don't always know what you're gonna get. These services are nice, but they come at a price which is either directly baked into the price of a room or charged separately at a significant markup. These services also don't always align with what the vacation goers really want when traveling, which is a place that just feels like home in a different city. For me, I hate not having a good parking spot when I go to a hotel. And I also really, really hate that the Wi-Fi in most hotels suck. Airbnb cut out a lot of amenities that catered more towards business travelers and offered vacationers their own kitchen, multiple bedrooms for their children, and an element of privacy that couldn't be purchased at any hotel chain. And that's one of the main reasons why people loved having Airbnbs is because you can have all of your friends in one place without getting these separate rooms. Despite the company's marketing as a way to share the vacation experience with a local host that can show you around a city, most respondents said that they did not care about this aspect of the service, and 70% stayed in a home that they had all to themselves, so they didn't have to share space with a random stranger. Despite people actually preferring not to share their short-term rental with a host, Airbnb still spends billions every year promoting this aspect of their service for a really important reason that will come up later. Yeah, I very rarely talk to my host when I stay in an Airbnb, if I'm staying in a shared area. Again, most of the time, we have our own private area, either the whole house ourselves or just a private studio in the back. The things that made Airbnb are now either being lost or offered by competitors in three areas. The first is price. Airbnb is no longer an affordable alternative to budget hotels. It is now a premium option competing with premium five-star chains. Well, if you consider it, you're renting an entire house compared to a small, small room in a hotel space. It's kind of fair. The second area where the platform is losing out is its monopoly on homes away from home. Hotel chains have significantly increased their offerings of apartment-style accommodations that do away with typical hotel services in exchange for larger rooms with multiple sleeping areas and kitchens. Hell no, these things suck. If you've ever been to one of these, it's just an awful experience. You have a refrigerator in your living room that's right next to the bedroom with no door in between, so that thing is super loud. Generally speaking, this is not your own space. You still have neighbors, and if they have dogs in the place, it's gonna be super, super loud. So I'll totally spend a week living in an Airbnb than living in one of these places. The third area that turned customers against Airbnb was service. Hosts wanted to cut down on the work they needed to put into managing their properties, so they started putting more unrealistic expectations on guests about cleaning up before they leave. It's like a viral post, right? They're like, they're gonna charge you a fat cleaning fee, they tell you to do all the dishes, put all the things in the laundry, and clean the house completely before you go. It's pretty ridiculous. Customers can choose to stay wherever they want, and the threat posed by Airbnb and other short-term rental options has forced existing hotels to improve their offerings. Hosts were investors who need to accept that all investing carries risk. Most of them still own a home or multiple homes that they can now lease out in an overpriced rental market or sell likely for a profit. That's why it's good to have multiple exit strategies. Even though short-term rentals may be annoying, hopefully they bought at a price and they can rent it out long-term and still be okay, or just sell the property for a profit. But the problem of unaffordable homes in certain cities is becoming so bad that politicians are introducing new policies that will limit how many short-term rentals are allowed to exist and charging hosts additional taxes for running unregistered hotels. I think this part is complete BS. As a landlord, you should be able to do whatever you want with your property. After all, we put in the hard work to purchase these properties and whether we want to rent out to somebody for $5,000 or $1, that should be our decision as the owner. The government stepping in and telling us what we can and cannot do should not be allowed. And in fact, if they really want to create more housing, they should just create housing and subsidize it. We've seen this happen in other countries like in Singapore or even Hong Kong where they do create affordable housing for the general public and then anyone else that wants to live somewhere else can pay that higher premium. If I could charge $100,000 a night, I would, but I can't because people wouldn't pay that much. So so in reality, there are people out there who are booking our places and they are spending the money to be there. So charging these extra taxes or just banning it in general is not good. The other group cracking down on short-term rentals are the people who you would least expect to be the heroes in a story about housing. Homeowners associations. Owners associations in apartments and suburbs that have them are blocking owners from renting out their homes to short-term stays because residents who live in their homes don't like loud parties and additional security risks that come with the short-term guests. Some hosts are simply ignoring these laws and taking the fines into account as a cost of doing business. Homeowners associations are pretty annoying because they make you do things that you may not want to do with your own property. But in this case, I kind of understand. If you're in homeowners association and it's kind of like a little club, then if everyone together decides that they don't want short-term rentals in this area, then honestly, the 
best thing to do is just don't buy in this area. That's why I hate homeowners associations and I try not to buy any properties in one. And if I do, it's something simple like making sure grass is cut. Urban planning professor David Walksmith found that 45% of all short-term rental listings in Los Angeles are illegal in one way or another, and that the city could have levied between 56.8 million and 302.2 million in fines in 2022 alone. The semi-legal approach to rentals is still working for some hosts, but it's creating problems for the platform. Airbnb is spending hundreds of millions of dollars across the world fighting legal battles for the right to operate, and that's why they still spend so much on advertising their service as a way to see a new city with a local host. Even though most of their properties are rented out as whole new homes where a guest will never even see the person that owns their home, it's much harder to regulate shared short-term stays because it's harder to distinguish them from someone just staying with their friend. The folksy image of someone sharing their bedroom with curious travelers who want to see a new city with a local is much better PR than a multimillionaire or institutional property investor who has just listed their 10th home with a tech company worth $80 billion. But it's kind of ironic because usually the person who only has one or two properties is the one who doesn't have all the systems set in place. So they're probably more likely to have these issues like having a big party in their home. Whereas more experienced hosts may have different ways of sussing out people right from the beginning. The platform is losing its control on guests, hosts, and the general public. Airbnb has always had competitors like VRBO, but now incumbent traveler sites like TripAdvisor, Booking.com, and Expedia are launching their own short-term rental platforms like Turnkey or incorporating them into existing sites that already aggregate listings from multiple hotel advisors. I think VRBO actually allows you to indicate their listing on Booking.com, so I think they're kind of working together. Airbnb charges a host fee of 3% to the people listing their properties, and a service fee of 14% to guests. Some hosts have found it cheaper to advertise their properties through local agencies and split these savings with guests. Ideally, you have your own website that you can bring people to. But honestly, Airbnb is a great advertising platform, so we still use it. Apart from the brand name and recognition, there is nothing to stop these new entrants entering the marketplace from taking market share away from Airbnb by offering a better service or charging lower fees. The bonus fifth reason behind the Airbnb bust was that the platform was never set up with longevity in mind. It has made billions in just a few years, and for its founders and early investors, everything else is just a bonus. So to be fair, if there was another hosting platform that can give me a lot of bookings, then I would totally jump off of Airbnb. Again, this is strictly an Airbnb problem and not a short-term rental problem. But overall, I found this video to be very accurate with the current situation with short-term rental properties. We're currently seeing a lot more regulation and less bookings than usual, but the bookings that we do have tend to be very good. They tend to be people who are moving or they are companies who are moving people inside and they need a place to stay for a few months at a time. It seems like the midterm rental space is doing a lot better than short-term rental space. And actually having a midterm rental bypasses a lot of the short-term rental ordinances. So even if city says you cannot have a short-term rental here, you can still put your property on Airbnb as long as the minimum is 31 days or more. But let me know your thoughts about the short-term rental space and if it's even ethical to rent your property as a short-term rental. If you guys have enjoyed this video and you guys want to learn more about short-term and midterm rentals, then check out this video over here where I'll go over a tour of our latest Airbnb. Thanks for watching. I appreciate you and I'll see you next time. Take care.